doing great tonight. Thank you very much for your attendance. Marhaba um, It's nice to see all of your faces. Inshallah, I just want to introduce tonight's speaker. His name is Dr. Uthman Muhammad, and he's here to discuss with us how we can talk to our teens, inshallah, or communicate with our teens in many different ways. Mashallah, Dr. Uthman Muhammad is a professor and a psychiatrist, and he's always, 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 always ready to help the community, mashallah. So, inshallah, I'll pass the mic to, that's to him, and he can um, start his lecture today. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, who here, Mima bihki English hon? Who doesn't speak English here? Kullu Arabi? Okay, it's going to be an issue. Uh, the rest of us, we all speak English. Everyone speaks English here. Who doesn't understand Arabi here? Who does not understand Arabic? Okay, all right. So it's going to be a, a difficult puzzle to <laughs> assort. So it's going to be in English, and some brothers will translate, inshallah, so we can all get it here. So I'm going to interview a few people here, and uh, if the sisters, uh, any of the youth sisters wants to also sit in this chair, you're welcome to do that. I'm going to interview some people who grew up in America, who are younger people, so they can tell us more about their experience, how it felt to be a teenager here, okay? So I'm going to ask a few questions, and so we can, inshallah, all kind of learn from this, uh, this experience, inshallah. Uh, and... Um, yeah, I hope to make this practical, so we're not like talking about theories of development and things like that. Uh, so we can all, inshallah, benefit, inshallah ta'ala. So it, this is your microphone, Muhammad, right? Muhammad, okay. So Muhammad, tell us, where did you grow up? Yeah, yeah. You want to take this and talk to this one? Or? Okay. As-salamu alaykum. As-salamu. As-salamu alaykum. As-salamu alaykum. As-salamu alaykum. I grew up, I was born here. Um, and I lived here until I was about six, and then I moved to Syria until I was 14, and I came here, alhamdulillah, and I turned 15 here, so I went to high school here, and I went to college here, alhamdulillah, and I finished college, so I went to, to public school, I went to Malden High, actually, that most of you, alhamdulillah, know. How, how was it, Malden High, Is it, was it good? Um, like when it? I first came, it was a big culture shock, because, you know, I came from Syria. You, you spoke the language when you came here? A little bit, language? a little okay. bit. I, okay. I mean, alhamdulillah, I did, but it was a little bit like it would take you, take me processing time in my okay. head to, to convert the language right in my okay. head. Um, and you and you came with your family? Who did you come with? I did. Alhamdulillah, my whole family is with me. Okay, so when you came, you came with your family, and so your parents spoke the language. My dad does, yes. Okay, all right. So you had to adjust to the culture. Your parents also had to adjust to the culture as well. They didn't. <laughs> didn't have to, they didn't adjust to the culture, so no. they struggled to adjust to the culture. <laughs> okay, is your dad here? Or mom here? He's not here. My mom's not here either. Okay, all right. So you can talk whatever you want, I guess, right? Is it recorded? This is not recorded, is it? <laughs> okay, you're safe, inshallah. Yes, inshallah. <laughs> is it? Inna lillah, inna lillah. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so let's, let's uh, think about a couple of things. Okay, so when you say cultural shock, what does that mean even? And but in full disclosure, if you want to talk about things that are too sensitive, you don't have to. This is like the public now. So, but whatever you're comfortable talking about, so you can filter whatever is uncomfortable, and keep whatever you think is good to share with the public. But what's um, the cultural shock? What was it for you, like cultural shock? What does that mean? I think people just are a lot different here. Actually, people I noticed in high school, people are a lot more closed off than they are back in uh, in the blood. Yani, people there are so yani, they, they, they show excitement to see you Here it's like so cool to show that you don't care About anybody oh, so It's like a vibe you know? It's like cold. people want to Is this because you come from a different culture you think? Maybe Maybe they, but they're like, a little xenophobia. In the blood it's different Like when you see somebody It's okay to be happy to see somebody oh, okay. Here it's like They kind of You know they don't That's not really shown as, as Unless I'm actually with my friends That are also Arab like also oh. grew up in this type of culture. Okay. So people so kind you of had give to a deal cold. with that. So you yeah. saw that firsthand. It's amazing. I never never actually knew about this. What else? Um I think what people value, I guess. Like I mean, I'm going to be very honest. As soon as I came here, the whole conversation was about interaction with interacting with the other gender. Oh, 
like um, your, your parents, you mean? Your parents are this conversation? No, no, or not the, my, like my, the not youth, the, the guys, you, I mean, students. people, friends, friends. At, at school, okay. like non Muslim friends. Okay. That's like always the topic of discussion. Um, and it became something like if you don't do it, you're kind of out of the loop. You know, like you don't, you're not, you're not one of them, kind of. Um, so it was really difficult to to navigate being, I guess, part of the group, but not at the same time. It's like you're you're the outsider who's looking in, who can't talk about what they're talking about because you don't have the like you're not doing what they're doing. Um, so so I'm, you, I'm, you always feel I'm trying to out. imagine what that feels. So I'm a teenager. Mm -hmm. uh, my family at home is saying haram, haram, haram. Like girls, no. Boys, no. Be careful. You know, you're gonna be in big trouble. You know. And then, even, but at school, I'm even failing at this, like quote unquote, per their own criteria. I am not even able to get a girl, or a girl not get, can get a boy, because we don't want to do that in the first place. And we are being blamed for being failures. And at home, we're being hammered with this constant haram, haram, haram. But how does that feel for a teenager? Um, it feels like, very, like it gets really isolating unless you have friends that are okay. also. And that same path. And I was talking to one of my friends about it earlier. We were having dinner. Okay. And we said, Lani, Wallahi, it's all about the group of friends. If you don't have a good group of friends, you're, you'll, you'll, and I have a lot of friends from high school that, okay. that are Muslim, but. Okay. What did you have for dinner? Oh, we had sushi. <laughs> sushi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good for you, man. So, uh, okay. So, uh, basically, belonging to a group. Yes. Like feeling that you belong somewhere as a teenager is really important. If you don't feel that you belong somewhere, you're, you're gonna be lost maybe, right? You're gonna find somewhere to belong. Yeah. If we, if we don't give the kids yeah. somewhere to belong, they're gonna find somewhere. And to belong, what do you need to belong? Like, how do you belong? Like, say for example, at the masjid, or like, how can you, can you be, can you, be, can you come to the masjid and be a part of the community and still not feel that you belong? Is that, is that a possibility? Could that happen? Um, the it really depends. So, like, if I come to the masjid and I see kid, like, I guess when I was when I was growing up, teens like me yeah. that are also at the masjid, I won't feel as left out, right? I would feel okay. There's okay. my friends, but if I do come to a masjid and it's just I'm just the only young kid there, and yeah. uh, what tends to happen is that one young kid is everybody's watching him and making sure he's doing his everything mm -hmm. correctly. So, you get direction from home, you get direction from school, and you get direction from the masjid even more. Mm. So it can be, you know, it's like you're you're being micromanaged anywhere you kind of go. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, some brothers are, they're feeling it. They're laughing. <laughs> what are you laughing about? This brother is spilling his heart out. And you're <laughs> laughing. Hey, you were nodding. You said yes. You can actually, you can still, you know, come to the message not feel that you belong. What What do you want to say about that? Um. So you said that, you know, you, you initiated the the question of yeah, I need, um, going somewhere but feeling that you still don't belong there, right? Yeah. So like, yes. Yeah, so for us as little kids, this, this is say for me, right? Sometimes, actually, no. I were, yeah, I need, I'm a mentor at a youth group, right? Sometimes I feel as if yeah, I need, when I'm talking to the kids, he tells me, oh, I actually don't want to be here. It's just my parents are forcing me to be here. So you kind of there, but you don't feel like you belong there because every time you start to initiate some sort of conversation with the other kids, you can't really um, be friends with them or you're just not on the same page. So they just tend to do their own thing. So they grow a little, uh, the more they grow, they grow apart from the masjid as well. And they grow apart from, you know, uh, I guess being a Muslim as well. Um, it is. Why did that happen to these kids, do you think? Why? I mean, here the parents are bringing to the masjid, doing the right thing. Why are they feeling left out? Why are they feeling that they're alien to the masjid? I'm assuming the parents are probably religious, right? Like what happened? What do you think happened? Allah, I think um, it can be more than one factor, but, uh, you know, me and my friend, we were having dinner earlier today, and we were talking about... Uh, sushi, yeah, sushi. <laughs> We're talking about it. Sushi <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. But um, 
you know, we, we can only do so much, but I think it's it's really it develops from the relationship from from home. Yeah, I, mean, I know of people that their parents are very religious, but you know, when it comes to communicating with their kids, it's like this there's like a certain barrier that they can't understand and whenever they wanna open up for the to them, they just can't. And I feel like that's one of the factors. I love it, right? I think part of being a good Muslim is being a good communicator and uh, being compassionate and um, being able to go out of your way to uh, speak with your child. I mean, Luqman and his beautiful address to his son, Ya yeah, yeah. Um So, uh, I guess it depends what people think to mean religious, but if we look at the definition of a Muslim, they, they have to have that good adab with their children. Uh, but going off what the brother said, um, there is another factor which I think is very crucial. It's that uh, the parents, even if they are doing everything right, uh, they're competing with the phone and every type of bad influence, like even non-Muslim children uh, who fell into some very nasty, um, let's call them social agendas. We don't have to get into too many details. But by all means, the parents are very supportive. They love their kids. Uh, some kids go on to be uh, state athletes. They go to Ivy League schools. Uh, but then they get snatched by some human shaitan from uh, the internet and just completely warps them. So what I have seen, at least for some of the youth that kind of fall in this category of, of being alienated, uh, it's when, I, when you talk with them, you find that they... When you talk with them, it's like, uh, how do you know all of these ma mature adult things? And it's because um, there is that uh, unbridled access to the phone. It's even if you do your best as a parent, raising your child when they have access to the to social media or to the internet, wherever, is like filling a cup with a huge hole in it. So there's this other factor as well that that it plagues everybody in this country. So. so I'm hearing void. There's a void that has to be filled somehow. <laughs> Not filling this void, the phone is going to come and fill that void. Something. Is, is that right? Yeah, and if the phone gets to you first, you basically are fighting a very big battle. Yeah, from the get go. I mean, you have two year old kids who know yeah. how to use an iPhone, so it's a problem. Did you also have sushi tonight? No. <laughs> <laughs> Any sisters who want to speak? Any teenage sisters who grew up in this culture? You want to grow up in this? No? No? Okay, so uh, so I'm hearing two things. I'm hearing uh, so this is this is this is an issue. Like, so I guess yeah, Luqman gives us an example about how to talk to our kids, right? But how do you take take that Quranic example and apply it in real life? That's the big the big issue, right? Do, do you have any smart ideas about this? It's not really. It's it's more of a comment of. I think one issue, I mean, I noticed it myself, is we don't tend to remember that we were at one point younger kids. Like, I have a younger brother that I get very frustrated at for doing something, you know, something just tedious, nothing like crazy. He's just a young kid. And it's very difficult for me to project the idea and remind myself that I was probably way crazier than he was. Yeah, like 100%. So I feel like one of the issues that uh, is disconnecting us from the youth is remembering the fact like and you guys used to be like this at one point and like to recognize yani one thing that Sheikh Nabil mentioned to us in the past is is if you go to a house and like like I feel like parents have false expectations of how their kids should behave. Yani they think if you tell it's like a robot you click stop they stop you click go they go and with younger kids specifically with the ones that are growing up it doesn't really work like that you know like i feel like false expectations is, is a big is a big high one like they're expecting them to 
maybe a bit too much. And when like it's like think about it like this. It's like when you tell people to pray, make 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 sunnah al dhuhr dhuhr and the sunnah after fard the whole thing. People leave salah, right? You see what I'm saying? Like that when you, when you make it like oh it's mandatory to pray all these ten rakat, then people tend to like yo it's too much, so they leave it instead of just t- saying it's it's the four and then giving you know what I'm saying giving leverage for people who want to do extra. So I feel like that false expectation is really. It kind of like creates a clash between um, what the parents want, and then they don't even like it. Doesn't become uh, like the kid will never meet the expectations, and so it's, which means he's never gonna get rewarded. Which means he's never gonna get like praise for for the good things he does. He's just gonna get kind of blamed and blamed and blamed and attacked again from that side, and then the school being completely different, and then you know what I'm saying that these different sides. So I do think expectations is a really big, um, big issue. At least with with what we're like what we see with the with the with the youth with youth kids. Some kids don't know how to make wudu. I can't expect them to get up and pray all of tarawih with us and and be with full khushur. You know what I'm saying? So it's yeah, really so you're about, saying that you have to meet people where they are. You just yes. can download yeah. on people kind of how they have to be. Yes. But hey, this is hey, this is very difficult. Like if you're a parent listening to this, like okay, this is like a full-time job. Having to worry about phones, having to meet my child where my child is, having to think about their personality, having to think about filling the void. This is very difficult. Like if you if you work in a, if you're in a family where the mom and dad have to work to support the family, and you have a full-time job, how are you gonna have time for this stuff? Yeah. You want a microphone? Uh, I'll give it to you. كنت أعلق على نقطة طيب بس خلينا على محطة شو طيب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله اسمي صدام حمودة بسم الله والصلاة على رسول الله الحمد لله رب العالمين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يعني جزا الله خيرا الحضور جزا الخير الدكتور محمود عثمان على تنظيم الورشة العمل يعني طلب مني أتكلم دكتور محمد محمد طيب بس يعني سبحان الله الموضوع يعني الكل بحاول ويعني الكل بيشتهد وال Trust me, I know this week and now. يعني with me the mentors, يعني سبحان الله. بس أنا مسجي للأمهات وللأباء قبل ال يعني اليوث إن شاء الله بإذن الله. فا yes, definitely, إن شاء الله بإذن الله. طيب سبحان الله يعني they asked me to talk about like youth and communication and what's the most like important things and how we can like improve our like. Communication with the youth and how we can like have the best environment for them. Yeah, يعني everyone try and subhanallah youth program here. Uh, Sheikh from uh, Middle East come here. People talking and people specialized in like the best way to like how entertain the kids and these things. We all try inshallah and Allah will accept our efforts and our intention and these things subhanallah. But يعني I want to emphasize in one thing that when I asked before here, I have a session now still running. In uh, Malden Masjids, we have like around 55 girls, subhanAllah, يعني, from 12 to 17 years old. And we all try and we have boys' sessions on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. يعني, uh, I just discovered that something, if you ask me, what's the void Hisham was talking about that? And there is no blame for parents and these things that the kids that, as Usman uh, said, that, Rabbu awladakum li zamanin ghayru zamanikum. يعني, try to like, uh, change your mindset a little bit, not change your uh, ahkam, your religion, sharia, change like, يعني, if you accept it to live in United States, subhanallah, you have to like uh, equip yourself with the tools how to deal with your kids here, and being aware about what's going on in the schools, what's the most important issue now in the, like, in the table, and what's going on in the media, social media, TikTok, these, these things, subhanallah. So I took just a quick survey before I come here from the young mentees. Yes, so... What do you think like you lack in your home? Because if your home is not the most safe, the most place where you find your serenity, I can speak loudly without telling me this is like, 
even one of the mentees uh, from Morocco, she told me, my parents always يعني, tell me if I start speaking about really what's going on, they told me you have no hushoma. So I asked what it's mean hushoma. And I'm from Middle East. She said, hushoma is like shyness or haya, modesty, blah, blah, these things, subhanAllah. So if I can summarize the most important things they said, which is the void, they said like, my parents, they want to treat me as, a bear, my, as I am like raised and born in Middle East, in Morocco, in Algeria, and these things. But this topic is like halas, exhausted to talk about it. And you mentioned something. I hope we come up with course of actions, not just being like puristic, theoretical. Like just like, okay, we all know. Everyone know better what I'm going to talk about, subhanAllah. But if I want to switch to, okay, what's the actions to do, subhanAllah. Yani look how, as Imam Malik said, by the way, just we have to always place the Quran in the first things to fix everyone. Imam Malik, he said, what's fixed the first generation will fix the last generation, which is Al-Quran. And not the Quran, the memorizations, the Arabic schools, the youth uh, program and these things. I never ask kids that, have you ever entered your parents' room and you find them praying Qiyam next to each other? No. Rasul said, Rahimallahu, imri'an qama min al-layl, fasalla. This is a past tense action, like they already mercy. The mercy descended on them. The reflection, mostly the kids, the reflection what's going on in the house. SubhanAllah. If I ask them, no. And this is during the outing sometimes, amazing questions. They tell you kids are very innocent and very honest. They don't have like to switch their answer or play with it. What, what the other important things that they, they never have gathering with the family like every week or like twice a week, weekend, something, for 10 minutes, open, open the Riyadh al-Salihin book, comment over one hadith or one ayah, tadabbur, not memorization. As one of the Sahaba, he said that, we lived 10 years that no one told us, kunna fityanun hazawira, fata'allamna al-iman qabla al-Qur'an, thumma ta'allamna al-Qur'an. We used to be kids, and Rasulullah is still alive. And he said, he never told us to memorize. We learned iman, then we learned Qur'an. Allah, it took me more than three years finding the books. What does it mean, learned Iman before Quran? Yani, the Quran is Iman, the Iman is Quran. Yani, I don't know how interchangeably we can like play with these kind of terms. SubhanAllah. Then I discovered like one of the books, the, the author said that Al Iman Qabla Al Quran, it's how to make the Quran very important before we memorize it. And this is the mistake we made now. We can do all kinds of motivation and gift surprises for your kids, and still they barely memorize one page. What's the issue? Because they see it as a like tune of songs, like rhythm, and these things, they don't live like how it's important, how it's descended, how like this Quran changed the whole nations. And I would rather spend years talking about the Quran for my kids, the story. People, they really need someone who like good at storytelling and these things, subhanAllah. Before, okay, memorize the Naba, learn Tajweed. And I, and I, I can't prove it. Wallahi, Tajweed course in United States failed 100 persons, subhanAllah. Kid, this is yani, the uh, cones come with Tajweed course worse than the boys, subhanAllah. The kids now hate, astaghfirullah, to mention, like, go to the Quran Arabic class, something. Tajweed, idgham, something. Why? Because it started from there. He should be started also, like, this Quran is amazing. If I memorize it like this, the story in this, where did you find this, subhanAllah? Allah in the Quran said, the Ahl al Kitab, which is uh, يعني, more prior to take this seriously. Qadijaakum, min Allahi nurun, wa kitabum mubin, yahdi bihi lahu mani tabar adwana who subula salam, we hurjuhum in a turumati la nuri bidne, wa yahdihim ila salatu mustaqim. And I found it to be honest in all like masjids mentality, imams, and these things. When it's come to youth, they put the Quran as a primary resource. Second, let's take from American mentality what's the best people who are talking about youth and communication and these things, which is important. To learn from everyone. Because the Quran is not the first place, Wallahi haram. This is what changed the whole ummah, subhanAllah. Some, يعني, كما كان يقول العلماء, الله في قلب كل مؤمن. This is what sometimes one verse could change, assuming that you did your best, your kids learn Arabic. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in Surah Al-Kahf, we're supposed to recite it every Friday or every seven days. Yani. When he used to re recite this surah in the Qiyam, he, when there is a verse, وَكَانَ أَبُهُمْ مَصَالِحَةً He said, وَاللَّهِ يَا وَلَدِي I will extend, I will prolong my prayer just because of you. And that's the أَبُهُمْ مَصَالِحَةً 
على أصح التفسير that's الجد السابع the seven grandparents how Allah protect that kids because his offspring سبحان الله يعني his grand 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 they were صالحين سبحان الله فthey know how to play it سعيد المسيب used to the, the same technique رحيم عليه السلام يعني مشكلة ال ال firm believe يعني إحنا we look all to the symptoms LGTB how we can handle this those are because we have the void الإنسان خلق أجوف but وإذا قرأت القرآن جعلنا بينك وبين الذين لا يؤمنون بالآخرة حجابا مستورا. This is will make a barrier between all kind of these shubhat and lawthat and wasakh غير المسلمين. Before you start, rather than you handle it, fill the good stuff so there is no room for the bad stuff. Allah said in the Quran in Surah Al-Hud, وأقم الصلاة طرفي النهار وزلف من الليل. Why? إن الحسنات يذهبن السيئات. But most people think in that good deeds will wipe out bad deeds. That's okay. But what does it mean? The other beautiful explanation for in al hasanat, yuthimna al-sayyat. Sorry about that. That's having too much good deeds. There is no room for haram to like come to you, to be exposed to you, or it's not going to affect you. Fa wa aqim salah wa staqim kama umrit. Subhanallah. You asked me to change the mic. I forgot the most important idea I was going to talk about. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. La ilaha illallah. موضوع قيام الليل يعني في الصلاة رحم الله رسول عليه الصلاة والسلام he used to go to his parents to Ali ibn Abi Talib and his daughter Fatima in the night and this is the most person who have etiquette يعني if we talk about when should I speak to person when should I approach these things in the night he knock on their door he told him ألا تصليان عمر بالخطاب he used to take turns I pray my wife then we sleep then our kids البيت الذي يقرأ في القرآن يصلى في الليل تتلاء الله الملائكة the last things that, as all mentees, they make me carry that message with me. The reflections. What we see in you, better than as people say here, actions speak louder than words. يعني they told me like, Muhammad or Hisham or one who said that, my kids dropped me and I'm here, or sorry, uh, Islam, because يعني, I have no option and they force me. Yes, because they never see you excited doing ibadah. Also, you do it because this is mandatory and I'm going to be held accountable and this is bad and this thing, subhanAllah. And plus, the most important things that you live here, you accept it to take some from this environment. Yani, this culture is very strong. Let us not deny that, yani, subhanAllah. It's very strong. So you, there's a price to live here. And what's the price? Open up with them. Let them like, speak. Even sometimes they speak things you never, and as ulama, uh, yani, they said, لا يفتي قاعد المجاهد. Yani, does not have kids. No one of us have kids 12, 15. So we can't put ourselves in their shoes. It's very hard. يعني جزاهم الله خيرا وعانكم الله و و و. But Subhanallah. يعني change your mind. Not as I mentioned in the beginning. Not change your حكام والدين غير. Change you like I have to hear things I never expected. I have to like see my kids different from my sister kids in Morocco when I go visit that three months. Because you decided to live here. And there is a price living in a Muslim country. That's يعني, so blunt, but sorry, يعني, we can't deny that. ف, to end up that, how kids' reflections, يعني, who you are, Ibrahim alayhi salam, when his uh, wife Sarah asked him, or uh, Hajar, she asked him that when he was trying to leave, and Allah told him, leave your kids and don't look even behind. She told him, Allah did Allah order you or ask you to do that? He said, yes. He said, اذهب فلن يضيعون الله. So that's the mom of Ismail. When he came back 20 years, 24 was Ismail, he never like saw him. Subhanallah. من عمل صالحا إن ذكرنا أنت وهو مؤمن فلا نحيينه حياة طيبة. Allah promised. ابن القيم said that. والله, if you don't see يعني results for your good deeds in دنيا, in آخرة, then you should accuse your actions. That's mean يعني try to purify your intention فإن عملك مدخول there is something wrong because Allah promised فلنحيانا حياة طيبة نأ سعيدة حياة طيبة ف when Ismail got tested again يعني سبحان الله he did not see his kids 20 years he found he found him a righteous man sometimes people thinking me on top of my kids this is the best way sometimes no sometimes make sure you are good and Allah will take care Yusuf عليه السلام in the jail the worst environment where there is a kingship and kings and women's that's the horrible environment. And if he became bad, subhanAllah, Allah will never. يعني, but there's no blame because look where I am. There's no parents. Since I start, I see people drinking. I see women. I see these things, subhanAllah. And please don't tell me those are prophets. 
Allah in every story of the prophets, he say لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِلْأُلَى لَلْبَابِ مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى Allah says in Surah Hud, وَكُلَّنَّ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ يعني Allah يواسينا ويعلمنا يعني what's applicable to them, applicable to us. فَوَنْ إِبْرَاهِيمَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ He came back, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most jealous when it comes to love, he wanted Ibrahim to be Khalil, he found him like so connected with Ismail, he tested him a little bit when he told him you have to sacrifice Ismail. Then Ismail, he told his dad, يَا أَبَتِي إِفْعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرْ سَتَجِيلُ إِنْشَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنْ الصَّابِرِينَ Also the firm belief, the yaqeen, inherited from that mother when she said, go, don't worry, we're not going to go, يعني, get lost. Allah in the sky will take care. His son, subhanAllah, took that things from his mom. And the last thing, subhanAllah, so you can console yourself in something happen, you did your best, and you feel like, where can I go? And it's getting worse, subhanAllah. Mentors know me that. I'm very يعني, يعني, frank and blank. I don't like to sugarcoat things. It's getting worse, subhanAllah. فاستعدوا للآخر يعني. نوح عليه السلام. SubhanAllah, يعني, Allah sent him more than 950 years to deal with his people. And then his kids, subhanAllah, rejected him. And when he told Allah, يا الله إن وعدك الحق وإن ابني يعني من أهلي قال إنه ليس من أهلك. So سبحان الله this is a lesson for us يعني نوح it's impossible Allah to send them to nations and نوح doesn't know to raise up his child. No, but there is a message for us. You could be the best imam, you could be the best alim, you could be the best things. But then Allah, this is your test. After you exhausted your means, this سبحان الله. Then what Allah told him إنه ليس من أهلك إنه عمل غير صالح. فا if you ask me what's like the message to take home, make sure, especially when it's come to women, you dress what your girls want to dress, the men's, you rush to Maghrib, Isha. And the best suhbah, when Luqman talk to his son, this is when you drive to Maghrib, Isha, Fajr. Ya Bunay, ihna, we're trying, subhanAllah. And I'm telling you, without youth program, without these things, subhanAllah, this is all like secondary sources. First resources, your kids see you burning. You worship Allah with love. Run into Fajr with your kids. Make the best like a car ride when they go to Isha to Duncan, link it to like basketball and these things, and you will see subhanallah, wallahi, the results and the effects in your house. Jazakumullah khayran, aqulu ma tasma'oon, wa subhanakallah, bhamdik, ashadu an la ilan, astaghfiruk, wa atubu alayk. Jazakumullah khayran, asadam wa barak fiqh. So this is, this is all very helpful because, is this working? Can you guys hear me? Okay, alhamdulillah. So I think this is important because this is like setting the framework uh, that throughout Islam, there are very important concepts that make us want to have a better connection with our children. Theoretically, right? But the question is, how do you apply these important concepts on the ground? I think this is where the struggle is. And... You know, me, so at one point in my life, I, um, I started going late to Jumu'ah, khutbah, because I don't want to listen to the khutbah anymore. Because khutbahs became very painful to me. Why? Because they're all kind of rhetoric, ideas, 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 excellent, beautiful ideas. But then when I go home and I try to apply these ideas, it, it doesn't really give me a practical plan. Then I started going back to khutbah because it's an act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not because necessarily I'm interested in the khutbah, but I go there in ibtigha' murdatillah. So there is a problem with the way we give mawa'id, I think, uh, because we take important general concepts that are extremely important that we have to know about. I'm glad that you really mentioned those important concepts but we, when we come to apply them on the ground the tools that we have are very, very limited so this is why it's important to I think kind of listen to the youth and I strongly believe that to apply these concepts on the ground we really have to use kind of more psychological tools we have to more use tools that are based in what we learned about what we learn about communication, for example, what we learn from some psychology. Why is that? Because, like you said, al-hikmah dalat al-mu'min. 
So if we find something that is wise, we'll, we'll go after it and, and, and get it. So I want to loop back to some of the things that the brothers talked about um, and, and go back to this, um, to this void. And you had mentioned something really important about how to fill this void. And so brothers were talking about the phones, how they fill, how they fill the void. And I was, I was um, mentioning something about how can you fill the void if you're a busy parent, if you have a full-time job, if both parents are working, and you don't have much time to spend with, with your kids. How are you going to do that? It becomes very, very difficult to do that. So um, I wanted to kind of highlight a few concepts that are important to think about. And needless to say, if you expected to come here and solve all the problems in the world that you have for your teenagers, you've come to the wrong place <laughs> because it's impossible to solve all the problems here. We're, we're really opening doors to think about things, okay? So I'm a firm believer that we cannot make it alone. We need each other to survive. And we need the wisdom to survive in any environment, not just you know, in America. Any environment is in the world is getting more difficult now. So I firmly believe in learning from the wisdom of other people. And I've pushed many communities where I gave lectures to have peer support groups, like a parent group, where parents huddle together you know, once a week, maybe once a month, to share their experiences. How does it feel raising a teenager? And parents can learn from each other and share their expertise. I think this is extremely important. Why is that? Because there is no one strategy that works for every family. It doesn't exist. Do we homeschool our kids or go to public school or Islamic school? I can't tell you. It depends on your family. It depends on your level of comfort. If both parents are working because they need to put food on the table, how are you going to home, homeschool your child? If Islamic schools are like a gazillion dollars a year, how are you going to pay that money? It's expensive. So you have to think where you are and come up with an inventory of your strengths. What are you strong in? What is it that is your strength? So, so for some parents who have the means, Maybe their strength is financial. Maybe they, they say, you know, you know, I can put them maybe in a, in a more specialized, maybe Islamic school. What if it's not an option? And for most people, it's not an option. What do you do then? Then you have to think about what are my strengths. Your strengths could be in the community. It could be that you have a circle of parents that you discuss once a week, once a month, parenting strategies that have worked for your family and see if others can learn from those same strategies. Like a generation that is older, can teach the generation that is younger. I think that that's an extremely important skill that we have to invest in. And if you don't have a parent support group in this masjid, please invest in one. Please invest in bringing the parents together so they can huddle and think about you know, some strategies to help uh, with the teenagers. So that's kind of one important strategy that you can, um, you can think about. Another important strategy is, and like Brother Saddam said, you know, they will learn from what they see, right? And what they see could be religious. So they can see you pray Qiyam al-Layl, and they can see you read the Qur'an, so they can learn from that. But sometimes that can be challenging, because if you send mixed messages, you will lose this challenge. So I, I know people who memorize the Qur'an, like Hufaz the Qur'an, and they destroy their families. Like their kids are just wild. They lost the relationship with the kids. Well, how did that happen? You're a hafiz. You pray the Quran. You, you pray Qiyam. How did you, how, what happened to your family? Well, what happened to the family is person have their own cultural adaptations. What does it mean to be a parent? Right? What does it mean to be a father? What does it mean to be a mother? What is the role that I have in my family? So in a sense, people come to the table with predefined roles that they want the other person to obey and to abide to. When this role that you've adopted for yourself is not reality-based, it's not based on the needs of the family. It's based on what you think the father does in the family or what a mother does in the family, right? So like, like what, for example? Okay, like... Um, Fathers are there to support the family financially and they work hard all day outside the house 
and then when they come at the end of the day, can a mom takes care of business because dad has to rest. Dad is exhausted from working all day, and now it's time for dad to rest. Why? Because I earned the bread for this family, and I get to rest at you know 6 p.m. and watch Al Jazeera, whatever you watch, and just chillax. And the kids are crying. Okay, you go take care of the kids. Okay, this is this doesn't work in this culture. If you're still doing this, it's not going to go well for your marriage as a man. I'll tell you that. Okay, why is that? Because everyone has to pitch in a little bit. Because parenting is a very difficult job in this culture. Very difficult. If you've divided the roles where you say, you do this, I do that, in an arbitrary way that is not based on the needs of the family, you're going to fail miserably. What is the, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is, is to say, what, what do my children need? Like this, my son and my daughter, they listen better to me than their mother, for example, or to their father than they listen to me. So I have to assess the needs of the family, and based on the needs, I come up with a plan. So a lot of, a lot of marriages fail. A lot of people fail in their marriages because they come to the marriage with preconceived ideas about what my spouse should be. And this, I've seen this a lot. People, like men, for example, because I'm a man, I can speak about men. Um, I get to do that. Sorry, guys. Uh, I want to mar get married to a doctor. Okay, alhamdulillah, you got married to a doctor. Ah, but you can't work, you have to sit at home. Sure, Habibi, sure. I'm a doctor, I have to work. I spent like 20 years in school. Yeah, but you know, in our Islam, we. Either... No, Habibi, no, it's not your Islam. This is your own understanding what the culture is. Okay? Then what do you do? You have to adapt to what the environment needs. So what is, what is my home need? What do my children need? I have to adapt to my children's needs. And that reflects on how I communicate with my children. What does that mean? Well, it means that some children, some teenagers do better with words, right? With speaking about stuff. And they're very verbal. So if your child is verbal, they have good language, then you can invest in that as a form of communication. Other kids are less social, less verbal. They know better how to do, not how to talk. So these kind of children, you have to do things with them. This is how you invest in their relationship and the communication. A guy was, I love this story, we use it in therapy a lot. I'm a psychiatrist, so I do a lot of psychotherapy, I work with a lot of families, I'm a child psychiatrist. So I love this story. I tell it all the, all the time to, to the parents that I work with. A guy was passing by a driveway, and this neighbor was, was fixing a, a very old bike with his son. Like rusty, dusty, terrible bike, like from the 70s. Sorry, the 70s generation. <laughs> Don't be offended. <laughs> but 60s. It's Irish. So a very old bike, rusty. You know, it's not worth the paint you put on it. It's just a very old bike. And he said, what are you doing? Ah, sick. I'm fixing a bike with my son. But why are you fixing this bike? But get him a new bike. He said, well, because we're not working on the bike. We're working on our relationship. It's not the bike. It's the relationship we're working on. But his, son doesn't, his son doesn't know that. His son is like, oh, we're fixing a bike together. But this is where you're bonding. This is where you're high-fiving. This is where you say, say, give me this, take that. You do this, I'll do that, right? So working on a project together. This is a form of communication, right? I know a father, um, his son like, hit puberty, and he uh, said, let's go to Costco. Okay, went to Costco, and then bought some stuff from Costco, and then he bought him like a razor blade, like a shaving machine. He's like, Dad, I go to, I go to the barber. He said, well, this is not for the barber. This is for something else. I'll tell you on the way back. So, uh, so this kid now is thinking, this is not... <laughs> What is this for? <laughs> so by the time they got home, said, okay, I know what this is for. So this is like a sensitive issue. Are we comfortable talking about these issues with our children? If we're not, we have to think about ways to talk about, about these things to our children. Why? Because someone else is talking about these things at school if you're not. Right? So if you have a, a standard of what parenting should look like, like you have a fixed image about how parenting should, should look like, what a father looks like, what a mother looks like, and you come to the table wanting to bend everyone's arms in the family to fit your stereotype, you're going to fail. You have to, you have to swerve 
you have to finesse, you have to be flexible. Another thought comes to mind when it comes to communication with teenagers uh, and children and how to invest in, in our families. You know, I think, you know, with the limited time that we have as parents, and we don't have a lot of time, it's important to find pockets of time on our schedule, like dead time pockets, like an hour between when kids come back from school to when you have dinner, for example. Like, look for these pockets. It might be half hour, an hour. We teach parents in psychotherapy that it is not the amount of time that you spend, but the quality of the time you have with the kids. And how do you define quality time with a child? There are certain things that define what is quality time that you spend with your child. Quality time is time that where you freestyle with the kids. And by freestyling, I mean it's not like a board game. It's not watching you know, a, a movie. Hey, Dad, let's watch a movie together. Yeah, let's bond. No, no, no. They got you there. They want to watch a movie, and you just said, yeah, and I'm just on the couch, they're on the couch. They, they won this argument. Right, no, so quality time is time where you do things together that are not very structured. So it could be like cooking a meal together, for example. Right? So men, you can cook a meal with your son. What? Men don't cook, man. They do. They do. Yeah, they do if they want to. Um, so things like that. Bonding with your child over an activity that you can do together. Why? Because my child needs it. But in my head, husbands, fathers, don't do that. Well, you have to change that a little bit. You have to change that a little bit. Right? So, um, so quality time with the kid is, is time that is, uh, you're freestyling, you're doing things that are not very structured, and where the kid can take a leading role in this activity. What does that mean? It means that you take their, their lead. They'll say, oh, I think we should put yogurt in the salata. Oh, let's taste how that looks like. Let's put some yogurt in the salata. Oh, once in a while, not every time maybe. But try that. See how it tastes like. Ah, it doesn't taste good. Yeah, maybe next time we'll put some, I don't know, mayonnaise or something. Mayonnaise is bad, don't use it. Uh, oil and vinegar. So things like that. So uh, the child leads the activity, and the parent follows the child. Why is that? Because when the roles are switched, the child will listen to you. Does that make sense? Because you, you let them lead, because other times you are going to, going to be leading. So they are comfortable following you because you were comfortable following them in an activity. Right? And we're not saying they're doing something dangerous. Right? Like, let's go, uh, I don't know, uh, bungee jumping, dad. Yeah, go ahead. Bismillah. No, we're not going to do the dangerous things like that. Right? We're going to do things that are just vanilla, like simple stuff, easy. Everyone can do it. Halal, you know, things like that. So this is a definition of, you know, quality time. In our quality, quality time, um, we are not using this time necessarily to do teaching. We're using this time for bonding. What does that mean? It's okay. Let's see how that, how that tastes like. Okay? So, teaching can be done somewhere, done somewhere else. Teach me how to cook, uh, I don't know, jaddara. Um, okay? Okay, well, I'll teach you. You can now be teaching moment. Also bonding moment, but for teaching. But when we're doing the quality time, we're not so much fixated on necessarily the teaching, but more on the bonding, per se. Uh, dad is fixing the bike with his son, and the son wants to paint uh, the, the bike with, you know, I don't know, a purple and green. Oh, it's okay. If the, the father's artistic, it might cringe a little bit. But that's okay. You can do that, right? So um, quality time is important because it facilitates communication as well. And if the child is the kind of an inhibited child who is not very verbal, that bonding offers what we call psychological safety. What is psychological safety? Psychological safety is being able to feel that this person does not have an inhibiting presence. 
an inhibiting presence, a domineering presence, not threatening, not like dangerous, but like inhibiting. Some parents have this presence where they're inhibiting for their children. When they're there, they just can't feel free and comfortable to open up and talk about things. So when you create a psychological safety environment, the kids are more prone to talk to you, open up to you, and tell you about what's been bothering them. So uh, we'll have to think, uh, this is not a lecture meant to uh, teach how to do things. This lecture and this event was made to help us kind of open doors and open questions and to make it okay to say that we are struggling as parents because it's a very difficult job to parent anyways, let alone parenting in the West. And this is an invitation from Uthman to say it's okay that what we've learned from common advice is not working for us. That's okay. It's okay to say that religious concept that I'm learning, I don't know how to apply these at home. That's okay to say that. It's okay to say that stories of the prophets, السلام, they seem to be a different time. I don't know how this matches our times. It's okay to say that. Very okay to say that. As long as we adhere to our principles of Islam, how you deliver the message and how you teach the kids is an art. And it's a science. We have to think about you know, the best way of doing that. And maybe we'll uh, leave it here and open it for questions, inshallah. tend to raise or try to raise one of the ways of faith that we will grow up at home. And that's the biggest thing. Uh, look at us, for example, from Kiva Sajid. Kiva Sajid, we only have a small group here to come to learn how to teach the kids, how to learn to communicate with the kids. I think the film that we blame, if we blame the kids, that they're not doing this, they're not doing this. The kids are like sponge. Whatever you do, so yeah, I think. I, yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate that you're making this to teach the parents. Yeah, I think, I think you know, these are very difficult and very sensitive topics, and it is easy to get kind of sucked in into self-blame and kind of uh, self-flagellation and blaming ourselves, right? And yeah, you can do that if you want to. Uh, but I think uh, in psychology, we teach people how to be solution-focused and not problem-focused, okay? What does that mean? It means that if I think about a problem, I am thinking about it because I am thinking about a solution for the problem, right? versus thinking about the problem to pin it on someone, right? Like pin it on me or my neighbor or the community or blaming ourselves, right? Uh, why is that important? Because guilt and blame are such powerful feelings. If you get stuck in the blame game, this will restrict you, it will shackle you. It becomes very difficult to have mental flexibility. Okay, let's, let's take it easy and just expand this concept a little bit, okay? So, mental flexibility is the ability to finesse, to change gears, to say, okay, this is not working, let's try something else, okay? I tried this strategy, it's not working, I'm gonna try a different strategy, okay? Uh, this mental flexibility, you have to be emotionally good, to be able to do it. You have to feel well, right? You have to feel confident to say, mm, let's try something else. If you got sucked into guilt and self-blame, 
you're not going to feel good. You're not going to be able to have this mental flexibility. Am I making sense a little bit? Is, is, that, is that clear, kind of what we're talking about here? Okay, good. So it is important when I feel that I'm not doing well as a parent to normalize that and say, this is normal. This is part of the parenting experience. I'm not going to succeed 100% of the times. I'm going to fail sometimes, right? And then to then switch gears from blame to problem, solution, uh, problem solving to being solution-focused and not problem-focused, okay? Uh, and the reason I say that is because many preachers and many wa'adh and khutbah masajid and, and the jumu'ah, they are problem-focused, not solution-focused. You, you almost were going to hear the Imam say one day, yeah, he's, not, he's, he's not saying it, but he's implying it, right? What happened to our ummah? What happened to us? How are we going to meet the Prophet on the day of judgment? Are we true Muslims or are we not true Muslims? Uh, what is la ilaha in our lives? Okay, dude. Okay, we get it. We're not doing great. Okay, what do we do about this? Okay? So the rhetoric that we've heard many times is that of not being really solution-focused, but problem-focused. Okay? Uh, so uh, I'm only saying this because this is very common. And I myself felt that way many times as well. So it's important to kind of switch gears. Yeah, go ahead. I just keep it away from your mouth. Oh, you okay. Strong voice. Uh, as you mentioned, like uh, solution focus. You said that you felt many times that you just go Jum'a because it's Jum'a, you know, it's uh, like a norm. So I received a lot of messages from mentors also who they are like 19, these things. She said, I feel like imams are detached from reality, imams, khutbah, jum'at. She said, like, why should I go? And you keep telling us, like, Rasul emphasizes on, like, women should go for masjids and used to go pray fajr and this. She said, like, I never feel like he's talking about, as you mentioned, like, just the symptoms, not the remedy, not the root causes for everything, subhanAllah, type. To make this solution focus, how we can, like, have those kind of imams where they're, you know, barely from, like, among 10, 15 masjids, you find imam who, like, really, like, like containing the whole community, like talking about everything related to them. And uh, he's working on the elder people, on the youth, on the woman's side and these things, subhanAllah. And those are like the like forefront of everything. So how we can fix this? And this is subhanAllah, yani, something hard because those are like the main like accessible uh, yani, tool for those youngs. If they can contain them, we are like really like accelerating the solutions. And subhanAllah, those people who are spending, yani, their kids older than us and they still the same mindset. How we can change this, 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 or like how we can like... Find yeah, so this is a little off topic, but we can answer that very briefly. Uh, we're, we're not going to fix them. Yeah, there is no solution. Yeah, the solution is at home. Yeah, because there is such a big shortage in this country. It's impossible to meet the needs of the imams in this country. Until you're able to produce your own imams in the U.S., until the youth here grow up and get invested, like Suhaib Webb, for example, and people like him. Yeah, but until then, we're talking about like ages because the, there's so many massages and there's so much shortage. So I like to uh, enforce for the youth, you know, you're going there because Allah said, go listen to Khutbah Jum'ah, right? We're not going there necessarily because you like what this guy is saying. He, this guy's giving you a reminder. If you rem remember something good from him, Alhamdulillah, if you don't, this is how he's trained. He's not trained to kind of be, and this is not just here. Like I grew up in Lebanon and I felt the same way about the khutbah in Lebanon because religious traditions, the schools of religious education, they're detached from the world, very detached from the world and their solutions are not reality-based. Why? This is a whole different political kind of uh, thing conversation. Uh, but, I, but that's for a different day, maybe. Yeah. I think you just answered what I was going to say. Train. Yeah. You have, to, you have to be trained, really. Yeah. Uh, just reading the Quran and memorize said, that's it. But they're not trained. They have to train how to deal with kids, really. And they're not. It's like yeah. I do Islamic. I used to do Islamic finance, and many imam doesn't know much about Islamic finance. They have to. They have to learn. They have to read, and they have to study for years to understand. It's the same thing with, with this. They have to be trained, really. But I think to add, 
to add to this point, like we are asking much of the Imam because you need someone who recites the Quran beautifully, someone who memorizes. And you cannot have one person be in different hat. So unless we have budget to hire someone who's good with youth, someone who's good with conflict resolution, we cannot. We cannot ask one Imam to be good in different specialties. You are a psychiatrist. You, can, you are not a uh, OBGYN doctor. You are not like you see, so you cannot, so like you have your own specialty. So it's the same thing for imams. We have, we cannot, that's, that's, the, that's the challenge. We want an imam who's superhero. Wherever you put him, he's good. That's, that's, I, I, that's think it becomes, I think it becomes difficult when imams are being invited to the platform to talk about topics they're not well versed in. People make assumptions. Oh, the imam will talk about, you know, how to treat your child in the West. Habibi, you came here like last, last year. What are you going to talk about? Well, uh, I'm going to take a butt and the brother will translate. It doesn't work that way, Habibi. I'm so sorry. It doesn't work that way. Okay? So I think if we do that, we will be doing our imams a disservice. Because then the children will say, okay, what is this guy talking about? Right? So I think imams have to be held in a very respectful manner and to respect their position. Uh, but also we have to make sure that we're not pulling him and sometimes we we are at fault like the board of the masjid for example, they pull them in everything come talk to us about this it's not my thing to do that right so I, have to, I think to respect that but can we go back to about communication maybe and the raising teenager sister yeah yeah uh, bismillah go ahead um, imams i think the issue has been recognized uh that the imams need to be raised and and uh taught here because I think uh, it's very important for our kids to connect to them um, specifically kids who don't speak Arabic well they go to some massages they don't even up until now they don't provide translation even and I always I actually feel so bad for those messages because I feel like okay our generation is going to pass away who's going to come to your message who's going to carry on and who's going to continue this tradition, if your masjid doesn't provide the services in English. So I think we have Boston Islamic Seminary, we have Qalam Seminary, we have so many great organizations providing now training and certificates and diplomas for um, you know, future leaders. So this is, this is amazing, inshallah. Um, and thank you for uh, bringing this seminar here. I think it's very important. But I think, as you said, we need small action steps. I mean, it's all good in theory. But how do we actually do it? And how do we actually apply? And uh, also wanted to make a point about having multiple kids in the family. As you said, you have to be flexible. You, have, you cannot apply the same rule if you have different kids with different personalities at home. One may be shy. One may be very social. So you have to be flexible. You have to be able to adjust. And we, growing up back home, we always want to impose a lot of things that we were exposed to. You know, don't do this. Don't do this. I was working when I was 10 years old. I was doing this. I was doing that. What are you doing? You know, we forget, as Islam said, not Islam, I'm sorry, uh, Muhammad said, I think, uh, we forget that we were, we were young too. And we made mistakes too. So we have to remind ourselves constantly that, you know, we have to try to put ourselves in their shoes and try to think, what they're going through in this country. Even my own kids went through the Islamic school and then moved to, um, for high school to public school. Even they have some issues. So I think we have to take that into consideration too. So Jazakallah khair. Any other sister? Just a really quick commentary. I think, um, you know, I have three children, two girls, two, 27, 19, and my youngest is 12, who's preparing to become a teenager next year, inshallah. And um, I think that the, the misconception is that once that, you know, when they're young, you're all with them and they needy and, and, and you do everything for them when they're a child. But when they become of a certain age, especially when they're entering middle school, high school, you kind of like, let them go, be, per se. Um, I think that a lot of parents just let them do what they want to do. 
Um, and I think that that is the age where they need us, need, need us as parents even more. I think that they're old enough, let them be, let them be with their friends. We don't, we don't monitor them as much as they did when they were younger. But I think as they get older, I think that's when we need to be closer, much more closer to our kids. Um, especially because what I noticed with my children, because they're so different in ages and personalities, is that every, si every single child goes through their different problems through each generation, but more so now because, for example, the LGBT. Like that, when I first had my daughter 27 years ago, that wasn't like a, you know, there were gay people, but it wasn't like a big issue in school versus now where it's like, it's like that for me is the biggest thing for me. It's, it's my son being exposed to that in public school. So he, though he's older and more responsible and more independent, I feel like I have to be even more close to him as a mom. Not overbearing, but be close to him because we are competing with the West. Um, and we have a lot of work ahead of us. I'm specifically interested, I'm interviewing people left and right today, yeah. sorry about this, but like, here's my, like, my question. I think, you know, a, a developmental stage that kids get to, in, and it's very normal to kind of separate themselves from the parents when they become teenagers. Why? Because you have your own thoughts, you want some space to develop your own persona. It's, in, it's healthy in a sense, right? How do you manage this distance? How do you give them space while still being emotionally close? Any successful story that you're comfortable sharing at all? Anything that you can think about comes to mind? Um, the only one, the only example I can give is probably my middle child who's 19 right now. So she's almost at the end of her teenage years and almost entering her 20s. Um, she was uh, a very, very opinionated, um, hyper child. And, you know, we went through some things, but I think that you can't just be a parent. You also have to be kind of a combination of a parent and a friend. Yeah. So I think that you can't be too hard, of them, uh, hard on them, um, but you can't be too lenient at the same time. Now, my, my situation is a little different because I was raised here. I was born in the States. I was raised here. Okay. You know, I grew up in New York. I grew up in the hood. <laughs> so I kind of went through the school system here. So I know exactly what my kids are going through because I went through the same, mostly the same thing. Um, so I can kind of relate to them more so than if it was from a parent who was raised overseas coming here, you know, and trying to raise their children in the West. So, and I always try to find myself as being, um, you know, I was a child too, and I made mistakes as a teenager. So you, I, I just feel like with her, you know, I, subhanAllah, I didn't have a lot of issues with my children, alhamdulillah, but um, I think it was more with ideology of the school and her bringing those ideas from school home and kind of like trying to balance what we expect of her as a Muslim, but also respecting her as her individuality as an American yeah. as well. So it, it's kind of a, a fine balance. We, we took it one day at a time. We picked our battles and kind of like, Alhamdulillah, now that she's older and now that she's out in college, we're kind of getting to this stage where we're actually talking as women and we kind of get each other, you know? So I, I, there might be things I don't agree with her and vice versa, but at least I know that she's in a good headspace and I know that if she needs someone to talk to, that she can always come to, you know, her, either her dad or, or myself. That's amazing. You know, do you guys like onions? Okay, so, you know, think about the layers. Think about relationship with your kids 
layer upon layer upon layer, and there's this core inside that we're trying to protect, right? And different people have different opinions about what is this core that these layers are protecting, right? I mean, there is the outer shell that protects the whole thing, right? But as you peel off, you know, and sometimes life peels off on this onion, you know? It peels off these layers because of stress, because of, uh, quote unquote, westernization, because of alienation, because of a lot of things that could happen in life, because life can be, for some families, Roller coaster. What is the core thing, the last thing that I don't I never want to lose? What is that? People have different opinions. My opinion is it's your relationship with your child. This is the last thing you don't want to break, right? So if you push too hard, you might break that. Right? If you say uh, you know how people say those things sometimes? You know, you're not my daughter. I, you know, I disavow this bond between us because you kissed that boy. You can do that if you want to, but is this going to be beneficial if you do it that way? Right? So think about this bond you have with a child that will keep things intact. Because if they lose that, you might lose that. But if they lose that, this is going to be very detrimental for them. Even if they make mistakes, just protect that core. Because that's, that, that's the core they'll use to come back to you. If you destroy that, they'll have nowhere to go. And they'll go to the void or to the, I don't know where, the LGBTQ or, or what. Any, anyone who would basically say, hey, you belong here, come over here. Right? And they'll, ad they'll adapt and adopt a different personality. Even if they don't have, some people have, you know, the struggles of the LGBT community. Some people do have those, but some people don't. Right? Some people change things in their personalities to morph and to belong, right? So if you break that bond, if you bring, break that core, you might actually destroy the way to come back to you if you do that. Yeah, the brother in the back. And thank you so much for your generosity, sharing your story. Thank you so much, sister. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my point of view is her husband. okay. <laughs> I wanna. This is my wife, and I give you something back. Okay, <laughs> we have two branches in the house. We have executive, and then you know Jesus here. You know, uh, my point of view as a parent, as a immigrant coming to this country, we have the fear. The fear is the scary part of a parent. We come out of ideology back home, Islamic side, education. We want to bring all this package and throw it to our kids. When you have, uh, as a parent, you have, as a parent, when you have your kids, any parent, that could be animal, could be anyone, they just want to shelter them from fear. When you shelter them, that means you want to protect them from anything from today, for tomorrow, from the future. And then you don't want to lose your identity from back home. It creates like you know conflict between your personality and those kids. You cannot put a lot of heavy weight in your kids, and then they have a lot of influence from outside. You want to make your house as a mosque, as a place of Islamic education, of views, but you forget you close the door. But before they go outside in the street and school to learn all the stuff. You forget you have a window in their hand, iPhone, iPad, whatever. They learn, and then what they see through their small window, they take all your ideology you give them, they keep it through side. Or they say, yes, 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 and then they don't learn anything. When they go outside in the school, and you know, the site is open, they say, oh, this thing, this life is easy, better than us. When they come home, they're just going to ignore you or for respect, they're going to listen and throw it from the other side. As parents, I learned from the past, make sure you be more cool, receptive for your kids, listen to them, challenge them. We have a conversation at the table and dinner, something open object, uh, subject, something they challenge me. I stick in my view, they stick in their view. 
and then we keep the balance. I don't want to be mean, just no, this is my way, the highway, but we keep it open. Yeah, and then they understand that, they understand that, but they gave me respect, and the same time I gave him respect. And then they enjoy it. But I learned from the past, because the past, the first time with the first child, no, my way, the highway. You know, you get some, you get some bad results. How, how much time do we have? Just more uh, people's time. My, um, I have uh, three, two girls and a boy. Yeah, mashallah. Yeah. Uh, are we, what, what time are we done here? Do you know what's, how much time do we have left? Do you guys have to go? You're, you're good? Say again. So let me just, let me just, uh, do, do I have time? Ma'alim, do I have time bad? And they what? Okay, okay. Speaking of Qiyam, Saddam, Qiyam. Bismillah. So I'm going to share with you like a personal perspective, and, and maybe this is more for uh, immigrant parents. Most parents are immigrants here. I'm an immigrant. Im any immigrants here in the house? Im immigrant parents, maybe? Yeah. So, so, uh, so, so I grew up most of my life in, uh, in Lebanon. I came here when I was uh, 27, maybe. So uh, I grew up in in a masjid, you know, growing going to the masjid, you know, halaqat, you know, ilm, things like that, you know, um, hang out with different like tabligh jamaat. So I did like my my share of you know activism, um, and I came to the U.S. Um, and I lived with the MSA brothers on campus. Uh, that was in California, and uh, I didn't know what the MSA was. I mean, what's this MSA? The Muslim Student Association, you translate that to Arabic, Rabatullah Muslimin. Rabatullah Muslimin in, in Lebanon was like this <laughs> almost fundamentalist <laughs> your student group, like committed religious, you know, the brothers, you know, it's the real, the hardcore stuff, like real deal, right? So I came, okay, mashallah, do you have MSA here? Do you have Rabatullah Muslimin? This is amazing. We're going to do so many amazing things on da'wah, things like that. And I went to their event, and it was like bonfire. What's bonfire? And they were just having s'mores and playing volleyball on the beach and, and having competitions and running on the beach. Like, what is going on here? I thought this was the MSA. I said, yeah, but the, these are like the religious students on campus. Religious? <laughs> so what are s'mores? <laughs> Can I have a little piece? <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I felt that Something just doesn't feel right here with these religious people here. Like, what's up with these guys? And then I had a colleague who worked, I worked in a lab. I was a postdoc uh, researcher in a lab. One of my colleagues, uh, you know, Lebanese, Muslim, but not practicing, not hijabi, not religious. And she said, Uthman, you're a religious guy. I think you should talk to these MSA folks. Because I don't know what they're doing. They're not doing the religious stuff. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Even she was bothered by the MSA activities. So I felt that, you know, the religious Muslim youth were alien to me. You know, they said, give a khutbah uh, on campus. So I gave a khutbah about Halloween and jack-o'-lantern and the shirk that comes with the jack-o'-lantern and how this is all like a, a you know, apostasy and this is like, a, you know, Come from, comes from a pagan tradition. And all the brothers in the MSA were like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, we, we, we're okay with Halloween here. We're not worshipping Jack O'Lantern. We know it's like a pagan tradition. We just want the candy, man. <laughs> you don't get it. Like, you don't get that. Yeah, but in my head, these guys had to be educated about the roots of the shirk of Jack O'Lantern. And the truth is somewhere in the middle, I think. I think we have to be aware where this came from. We have to educate our kids. But me as an immigrant Muslim man, I felt that the model of what does it mean to be a religious youth in America was alien to me. And I had to sit down and learn and recalibrate what does it feel to be a Muslim youth in America because it's very difficult. It's very difficult. I don't celebrate Halloween still. I mean, on, on my Facebook, I got a pumpkin and I carved on it Halloween's haram <laughs> and put a, put a lamp in there. But, 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 I, but, but now I look at pe what people do and I'm, I don't make a big deal, big deal out of it. You know, it's not a big deal. 
the kids want to have the candy, right? So it is not as catastrophic. There are things that are catastrophic that we have to talk about. And we have to make those a priority to talk about these things. Uh, but speaking to the sentiment about how we feel about being, you know, an immigrant who comes to this culture, it will feel different. My kids will feel different. They're, they're, they're different than what I grew up. They're different not because, not because I am strict or I'm uh, stringent or because I'm close-minded, because psychologically it feels weird. And this weird feeling that I have is normal and natural. And it's okay to feel that way because you're meeting a new person from a new culture and you're redefining what does it mean to be a religious person in this culture. We have to accept this model and say it's okay to do these things. It's okay to s'mores on the beach and bonfire as long as we're not doing something haram. Yeah, so I uh, just wanted to give, uh, highlight that kind of important concept. Brother. Just say, leave them alone to do it. You know they can get get involved so much and yeah. deep in it, and you lose them. So explanation, which we sometimes we don't really do. We need to explain about these things. Why is haram? If you say it's haram, why is it haram? You know, explain. What? Uh, tell a story about it or something. Yeah. Yeah. So it's. I think it's very tricky how to have this conversation, and. I'm not going to tell you what my recipe is because uh, everyone develops their own recipe, okay? I think the bottom line is uh, all occasions, Halloween, Christmas, all these things that happen around us, they have the roots, the religious roots, and I think it's important to have a conversation about what this is about, right? And then how do we go about this is important. Like if my child says, I love Christmas time, all these trees, all these lights, people are happy. I think my recipe is say, yeah, it's, it's a joyous time of the year. People are having fun, people are celebrating, and it's a joyous part of the, part of the year. Versus all this is shit. Destroy all these trees, bring them down, don't be happy, be miserable, right? As long as we understand that this is not our Eid. You know, our Eid is in Ramadan, this is our Eid. But yeah, it is, people are happy here. Yeah, and it's, there are lights, a lot of lights, a lot of the festivities. Uh, but how do we celebrate our Eid? Then that's the important teaching point then. The our Eid we celebrate. We have fun at our Eid. We get all the gifts, all the balloons, right? Uh, Eid in our house is like a birthday party, right? And we don't do that to any other Eid or other, any other occasions. We, we have all the balloons in the world. We, we open gifts. We wrap gifts. We open gifts. So things like that. So I think everyone has to kind of carve out their own recipe, what works for the family, what, what makes sense to them, uh, as long as we're not, you know, selling our deen, right? As long as we can maintain our core, we're not saying, oh, you know, uh, Christmas is like universal celebration. It's okay. We're not saying that, right? We're sticking to our roots, um, and, but, we, but how we navigate is, is an art, I think. So, doctor, if you allow me, inshallah, to go back to the topic and talk about communicating with our teens i think it, we have here alhamdulillah a few like brothers who we think that they are a good example of teenagers or of youth i think it's a good question to ask them if they could share with us something or some tricks or things that their parents did with them that helped them become the person they are today we have mahdi mashallah we had muhammad hisham so i think to for practical lessons and for those recipe and ideas I think if they share with us what worked with them when they were teenagers, when they were in high school, what their parents did with them in terms of communication or other things, not just communication level, but also to build that connection and to build that bonding. What would you say, if I ask you today, what did your dad or mom did with you, Mehdi, for example, when you were in high school that made you the person today that you come to the five daily prayers and to take Islam seriously and become a good person that Everyone, mashallah, I'm saying that we want our kids to follow this example. Do you be able to share with us a few things that you still remember that your parents, both mother or father, did with you? Alhamdulillah, uh, I have four things to say. 
So two of them, you can do them very often, and two of them don't happen too often. The first one is to make dua for your kid. And yani, why I say that? Because the Prophet ﷺ said the dua of the parent for his son is uh, accepted. And also, uh, you guys probably do that all the time, but keep on going. And um, the next one would be to take them with you on each prayer. On Fajr, Isha, whenever you go, bring them with you. And uh, the last two, Alhamdulillah, when I was a junior in high school, my dad took me with him to Umrah. And that's probably the biggest thing, Alhamdulillah, that happened to me, which made me change. And another thing is, during Ramadan, you should take them with you tar tarweeh and stuff like that. Um, well, just going there and seeing the Kaaba and seeing, doing that kind of ibadah and spending the time reading the Quran, it's uh, you come back a different person. Yes, definitely. When I was there, you know, I felt really close with him and a very nice time. Yeah, but like I said, it doesn't happen very often, and it's not easy for everyone. But if you get the chance to do that, do it. And also with Ramadan, it's like a blessed time. And uh, so many times we see the masjid is like full of just grown men and their kid is not sitting next to them. So you should bring your kid with you. Right. You invite them, but they are not women. They have other things that are important, more important, more right. fun, more attractive. Take them to start away. You have to get some. Yeah. So uh, with me, if, uh, my dad, my dad would just uh, it first start with the Umrah. So Umrah is like a vacation. No, no, no kid is gonna say no to a vacation. But uh, with Ramadan, it's like a thing of reward. If you give them something, if they go, they'll come with you. Uh, come again. Um, I'm going to say something that might shock people, and that is what uh, makes Muslim parents sleepless at night is also what makes non-Muslim parents uh, sleepless at night. Um, I think maybe just in the last 50 or so years, you are seeing something that most humans never thought would be, which is in being an individual, individualism, being cut away from family, being cut away from tribe, uh, even... You could say people back then did some horrible things, but they did that in the name of a tribe where they did that as a group, as a community. And you have to ask yourself, why are so many young people, um, like we see the horrors that happen with uh, far-right extremism, for example. Um, again, these, uh, like gender dysphoria, really. Why do people fall into these types of issues? It's the same thing. And you, you live uh, in a uh, socioeconomic society that forces people both parents have to work nine to five they send their children to daycare and then you have an hour commute by the time you come home both parents don't even want to see their children they, no it's everybody they much rather watch you know something on netflix and what that does is it destroys people it destroys families what i've seen um since i was a child the thing the most successful kids the ones who really held on to their religion were those who came not just from good families but they were also plugged into good communities i mean the parents themselves it's a huge task but that's where the investment in the community has to happen and this is really upon every single member of the community i've had uh brothers like yasin ibrahimi pick up the tab they would uh when for example when my parents like uh you know it's, it's time to hang out they won't obviously come but there were brothers in the community i could come to al-huda i could go to isb um, in the ISB, brothers from MIT, Harvard, MSA, they raised me from when I was 12 years old until, until like, uh, you know, for 10 years, I was still going to them for advice. So it's a strong community that you have to have. And again, you can do everything right, but if you don't have that community factor, if you don't have uh, that approach and that knowledge that Yadullah ma'al jama'a, and if you try to isolate your children, you can do whatever you want, it's a losing battle. And the conflict is compounded with the void. We'll just call it the void. That's what it is. Um, 
So it's a systemic issue. It is a systemic problem. I mean, I'll be very honest, I don't want to offend anybody, but I feel like we've been just tackling things, uh, sim the symptoms and uh, piecemeal. But this is a systemic issue. Again, non-Muslim families are suffering too. Uh, they're losing their children to ideas that never even crossed the minds of mankind 10 years ago. Um, and a part of that is a lack of community. Um, that, again, this is just one solution. But um, uh, parents should be given credit. Children should be given credit. Uh, community should be given credit. It is, it is a battle. Um, but we are plagued with an individualistic uh, way of life. Even non-Muslims complain about this. And you, when, I, when you go to college, you feel very bad for them. They suffer. They have nothing but drugs and alcohol, and it kills, literally. It, and it actually kills them. They don't have a community. They're looking for that. Um, and that's, I guess, something that I've just seen work across the board. Uh, those who have, uh, even if, let's say, the families might have some issues, but the community is there to pick up the tab. So uh, this is not so much for parents or for youth as much as it is for every single member of the community. Uh, if you do want to have people pray with you in the next 10, 15 years, if you still want the masjid, invest in this community because if you don't, you'll be praying alone. Uh, so that's what I will say. Systemic issues require systemic solutions and that's upon everybody, inshallah. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Um, I'll just uh, speak from my, my personal experience. Um, so something that really helped me growing up here uh, was uh, just learning about Islam from my parents directly. Uh, so learning about the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on a personal level, like his character, his personality. Um, and one thing that I, that I learned from that is that it's people people learn more from inspiration rather than force. Uh, so they tend to do something if they're inspired to do it rather than you forcing them to do that thing. So uh, one example I can give is um, before Salat al-Fajr, like my whole family, my parents, my two sisters, we all get up together uh, and we read five ayat min al-Quran uh, and then my mom explains it. Um, and she ex explains, you know, as, as Baba Nuzul, why the, the ayat came down and, and then the meaning of the ayat. And then later on the day after Maghrib, uh, after everybody comes back from work, we, we talk about, we watch a lecture together uh, about uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or, um, you know, uh, one of the Sahaba. And that's something that just really helped me. Um, you know, force, it's, it's never going to work, <laughs> especially here. Uh, you know, we see all the other kids uh, in, in this culture, they, they do whatever they, they want. You know, they have boyfriends, they have girlfriends, they have, they do drugs, they go to, you know, they drink all this stuff. Uh, and when you try to force someone that's in that culture not to do that, you, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. They have to be inspired. Some families might do the same thing and might not work for them because children have temperaments, like personalities, right? So, and personalities many times are biological. Um, uh, in psychology, we have different personality traits. What makes a personality a personality? There are different components. There are five big components. One of the components of a personality is something that we call agreeableness. Someone who's agreeable is someone who's just mellow to work with, to deal with. This is like your nice friend that you want to hang out with because they're just low key. They're just low key people. You just ha they support you. They're good allies when you need them. Versus your friend who's like an analytical person, like uh, always wants to argue, always wants to discuss things. Right, always wants to like uh, compare and contrast, and so uh, so people have different personalities, uh, and we we think that part of that is is just someone is born with this biological. 
So if someone is high in agreeableness, if a child is high in agreeableness, that child will be easy to, to raise and to parent. And if a child is not that high in agreeableness, a child who's like combative or oppositional, who actually enjoys saying no, there are children like that, they it just, they smile when they see you frustrated. They say no and they look at you and you're like pulling your hair and they smile. And they say, ah, I got him. It feels so good, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so why? It's, we think it's biological. Okay? So why am I saying that? I think when we compare people together, it creates a lot of frustration. Like I'm doing the same thing. Why is that not working for me? Well, because you can't compare apples to oranges, right? That's not to take away from your story because it's an important story, I think, uh, because you lead by example, right? And you start the process early on. People ask me, when do I talk to my kids about like sexuality and things? I said, when they're five. What, five? Yeah, yeah, when they're five or six, that's when you start. How? Well, you start talking about biology and flowers and insects and animals. And then when they're eight, you say, oh, the same applies to other mammals. And that applies to humans too. And then by the time they're 11, 10, um, this day, the age is probably a little sooner than that. They get it. They understand it. Right? So you start from early on the process. And then it just keeps growing and blossoming. Versus you postpone talking about things until later time. So I, I, I thank you for sharing this generous story. It's amazing. Someone wanted to... Yeah. Um. Uh, to add, I guess to add on, uh, one thing that I've always I actually remember this very vividly for some reason. Um, my mom never so like whenever I would I would be like basically somebody would catch me doing something wrong like my mom specifically, she would never actually tell me that she saw me directly. What I mean by that is she would pull me aside and she would tell me a story about a kid that did what I did, that something bad happened to him, and then she would leave me like. To suffer kind of in my head like I'll get in my head and I would go and it would work I would come back crying mom it was me it was me who you told the story about and like she would do it and I remember she would do it to my brother and like it would really really work she's not here right now she's at home yeah she is in the US Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Subhanallah. it worked yeah subhanallah and I, I and it really reminds me of Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always mentions stories in the Quran of what bad like bad things happen to like the old nations, right? Like awalam yasiru fil ard. Didn't they go and walk around and see what happened to these people? And uh, the Prophet sallam, never directly talking about somebody on like in the khutbah, right? Like saying, yani what's wrong with people? Like very, very passively, without actually being directly um like straightforward, like on it. So she was never like she never forced, I had long curly hair, it was, I was going through that phase. And she never really like told me, like she never told me don't do, you know what I'm saying? It was really, really lenient. And it was kind of a few years later, I just kind of let go by, you know what I'm saying? You kind of let go of it by, by yourself. But this specifically for some reason, like she probably did this when I was like five or six. But it's still a vivid memory for me and my brother. Because... Like we came to terms like, yo, we were messing up. You know what I'm saying? Like it kind of like, like she, she knew what was happening. And in my head, I would be like, does she know? Does she know? Does she know? And then, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it really, it kind of breaks that defense like wall that you usually have if, if you tell the kid you did wrong. So they just, they attack right away. Um, <laughs> Uh, you mentioned something about the, the Halloween and uh, the other occasion that we don't celebrate. In my own experience, uh, what we did, I think, uh, and hopefully it was success. Uh, you, 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 for example, Halloween, uh, it's a holiday. For kids five years old, when you tell them Halloween, it's haram. He doesn't care about haram. All what he wants is candy. Give him the candy and he's happy. So basically you have to explain to him, okay, here's the candy and try to give him alternative. What we did, for example, in Halloween, we give them always alternative. The Christmas, for example, 
uh, they see the lights. We even ourselves we see the lights in the Christmas, and we we like it. it looks nice. So giving them an, an alternative that they could relate to in Eid, what we did is uh, every Eid, both Eids, uh, we. So we, the way we celebrate Eid is we, we do the lights just like, like they did. My my kids, my my son is 20 years old. Every Eid, before he wakes up, we give them a gift. All my kids, we give them gifts in Eid. This is our holiday. This is our Christmas. Halloween comes, all the holidays comes. They don't care about it. They care about Eid. So what I would advise, if it works for you, do the same. Make sure before you tell them, no, this is not our holiday, give them an alternative and enjoy, let them enjoy your holiday so they, they'll understand this is, this is our holiday, not their holiday. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, I think this is very helpful, you know, how we na navigate these complexities. And yeah, so I think, and also kind of, you know, kids grow and for each age group, there's a certain language that we use, right? So I don't want my teenager boy or girl to go to a Halloween party. Like that I don't want. I don't want them to grow thinking that, yeah, Halloween is cool, candy and costumes and then they got invited to a Halloween party when they're 12 and 13. They're like, yeah, we always had like a pumpkin and candy. Or we're just going to go to a Halloween party. What's that Halloween party? Right? So we have to kind of understand the age group. So I'm less concerned about the five-year-old in preschool, uh, kindergarten, taking some candy and wearing a butterfly for costume for Halloween. But I'm more worried about my teenager, boy and girl, going to a Halloween party. Right? So I have to kind of gauge developmental where things are. And then to, to invent concepts, just invent out of nowhere a concept. An arbitrary concept, Halloween stops at six. When you're six years old, that's it. We don't celebrate Halloween after that, six or seven. Why? Because it's, for, it's about candy and your cute little kids wearing like butterflies and bees at school. But after that, we, we, we don't do that. Why? Because you were looking at, at the future. I'm not sure if you've seen a Halloween party in, you know, been to one? Yeah. I've never been to one, but I, I've seen it in my apartment building. Not very halal. Very wise. Very wise. Very wise. Very wise. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, there's a couple of things I would like to mention. My name is Hanif Mughal. I came from Pakistan and I live here almost 20 years. I have, mashallah, four kids. they born here. I raised them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me help to raise them very good way. But what I learn from my own experience, the first of all, we all parents, we are waiting for our kids to grow up until six, seven, eight. Until six, seven, eight, we think they are children. And we think, oh, they don't know nothing. They don't know nothing. No, they know everything. They go to school. They learn a lot of stuff. At the same time, being a parents, we have to teach them at home every single day, even for 10, 15 minutes. The best part, what I learned and what I did, sit together with the whole family, make halqa talim, teach them Quran with the English translation and with the English definition, like all the story of Ambiya, like, like whole Quran, you know. So when they read in English, the, the translation and the definition, they learn who we are, what we are. They go to school, that's fine. Let them go to school. They make friends, let them make, make friends. But at home, you have to be more friend them, more friend with them than their own friend in the school. So they become your own friend so they can share all the secrecy with you. And uh, um, in that way, I think, inshallah, Allah SWT will help us to, to raise our kids in good way. And we do not have to fear, we do not have to worry about our kids in this society. 
but we have to do our own parts. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, I take you know all of us we talk and we have all the young young men they said one ten. All we're facing society, but all of us we forget the base. The base is the mosque. I think you know as parents we need to do something too. We don't make the mosque as Friday prayer and that's it. The mosque is the base for dedication, for friendship, for association, for all. But the mosque, they cannot support all this action. The mosque, they, they can, they have financial only for light, bill, and all this basic stuff. But when you come in to other 10, we want the mosque to do stuff, but they can't do it. We need some financial help. My suggestion is zakat. All of us, is majority the zakat, the center oversee, and then we come in all oh, our kids. No, you can do one year oversee, one year here for the mosque. If the mosque have surplus, he can financial or can bring more people to help our kids or make more programs, sophisticated program. That's what I can see. You know, very rich people who want to pay their zakat. That will solve the problem for the next generation. I can give you some names. I haven't been very successful to get them to pay their zakat. That's a real problem. Yeah. 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 We have to invest locally in our communities. Yeah. That's important. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I took your time and uh, gave you a headache maybe. I don't know. Uh, but inshallah, you uh, had some benefits. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim al-Asr. Inna l-insana fi khusr. Inna l-adhina amanu wa amanu al-salihati wa tawasab al-haqi wa tawasab al-sabr. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakallahu feekum. Thank you all for coming and thank you Dr. Ajman for being our guest. We hope to see you again. Jazakumullah khairan and have a good night. Thank you so much for starting this conversation.